Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Taking the Lead. I'm Ken Jacobs, as I think you know. And Taking the Lead gives me the great opportunity, the great gift of interviewing various leaders, mostly from the world of PR and communications. But we don't talk all that much about PR and communications because we talk mostly about leadership, that just ethereal, hard to define thing um, that is so important and that can change the outcome for your organization when you get it right. So I'm thrilled to introduce Valerie De La Garza, the CEO of Fenton. She worked at some other agencies and she's worked nonprofit and what have you, but she has been leading and guiding Fenton for some seven years now. So there's nothing more to say than welcome to taking the lead, Valerie De La Garza. Well, thank you so much, Ken. And I really appreciate being here. And I love talking about leadership. I think it's something that we all have in common. And I definitely think it is it is ethereal, but there are some good principles to talk about. You bet. You bet. So let's start with you know your leadership North Star, if you will. What are your most critical leadership tenets that have guided your career to date? Well, thank you. There are so many. Uh, but I think at heart, really, for me, when I think about leadership, I think at the center, it's about embracing problem solving. Mm -hmm. I think that the best leaders are natural problem solvers. That doesn't mean that we always get it right. But at least we have the ability to say, you know what, I don't want to admire the problem. That's one of my sayings around here at Fenton. Um, uh, clients pay us. Uh, to come up with solutions. And we can never be paralyzed by the enormity of a challenge, enormity of a problem. Um, we need to demand and, and bring that courage to have um, a variety of options, a variety of solutions. So to me, that's the, that's the, the, the biggest piece. Secondly, I think that as leaders, we can't expect excellence from others unless we demand that of ourselves. Um, the pursuit of excellence is never ending. Uh, and sometimes we need to fail to learn. Uh, and often those uh, those troubling, the sometimes the most humbling experiences can often yield the best lessons. And then I think, you know, I and I truly believe that the best leaders um, are empathetic and kind, that they command respect, not through intimidation, but through inspiration and modeling humanity. Absolutely. So true. And and if I may, I don't know that they command respect. I think it just happens because of that empathy, because of that caring, because of the role modeling, because of the comfort with making difficult decisions. It it, it really just seems to happen. And I, and I think, you know, if there are leaders who who don't feel respected, you know, my my counsel to them is, well, we know that energy is reciprocal. All this stuff is reciprocal. If you're not feeling respect, the question to ask yourself is, well, do I respect everyone on my team? And do I regularly communicate that? Um, so, uh, and, and, I, and I think part of it is also that that comfort of making decisions. You know, so many leaders or leaders in training are uncomfortable with making decisions and they delay and we'll talk about it again <laughs> with delay. And they don't realize that delaying a decision is making a decision and it's staying with the status quo. And that oh, really so right. an organization that really yeah. serves an organization. Yeah, you know, Ken, you got you, you're you're right on. Um you definitely, you know, when you're in the leadership seat, for sure. Um, your actions or inactions say very much uh, mm -hmm. about, that's why I talked a little bit about bravery and courage. Um, so I think we have to be in tune uh, with that and and very cognizant. So I really appreciate your comment there. Yeah, thank you. And I think, you know, you've raised courage. So important. Leadership is not for the faint of heart. We are all attracted like magnets to courageous leaders, especially in uncertain times, but 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 I but I think always, and you know, we always talk about I want to get my teams to take educated risks. Really? Well, you know, are are you 
are you uh, modeling the behavior you desire? That, that's the way to do it. So showing that you're comfortable taking educated risks. And, and I think where the courage comes in, perhaps, is where this feeling of we're smart, we're strategic, we may be right. And if we're not quite right, if we've got to readjust, we can do it. And that, that I think, comes from courage as well. So you've had some, some good leadership tenets, obviously, in your career. And you're not just talking about them, you're, you're modeling them, you know, for your leadership team and everyone there. So speaking of great inspired leadership, who are the top three leaders who inspired you? And tell us why. Well, so many, I have uh, so many mentors, so many people that I have admired and have helped me along my journey and continue to do so. Um, but the three people that really come to mind for me are number one, the late great PR legend, Ron Rogers. Uh, he, I worked uh, for the Rogers group and then it became Rogers, Ruder Finn uh, for 10 of what I consider my most formative years in my career. And, uh, you know, Ron was, uh, he was smart and he was strategic and, you know, he, he produced outstanding results. That's, that's a given. But what I loved about him is that he exuded pure joy every day. Mm -hmm. He absolutely loved the agency and he loved the agency business. And you talked a little bit about energy earlier, Ken. And, and so you felt that energy and you wanted to be a part of that. He was so proud of the work that we did for our clients, but I think he was even prouder of the staff members, of helping them along their journey as leaders. Um, and I often have now, I call them what would Ron do moments mm -hmm. in my role as CEO. And I think about that and I think about um, how he would comport and how what energy he would put out there. And I look to that. That is truly an inspiration. I miss him every day. And the second person is uh, Elizabeth Biz Daly. Uh, she was a vice president at Many Selvage and Lee, who I met 30 years ago as a senior account executive, just starting in the business. And she mentored me and she took the time to show me what great client service looks like, that details matter, all, all details, little details, uh, and how to be anticipatory of a client's needs. And I think the biggest thing is that integrity is really what counts at the end of the day in, in, in the business and what you're doing for your clients. And then finally, well, again, there's so many, but I, he's not in our business, but as a leader, um, Father Greg Boyle, who's the founder of Homeboy Industries, uh, which is the, the well-known and loved um, organization that helps uh, people who are uh, formerly incarcerated or gang members. And what I love about Father Boyle is that he's the ultimate problem solver in advancing social change. And when you were talking about courage and we we're talking about bravery, um, nothing can be more brave than putting a great idea out there and figuring out how to how to make it happen. That's a great quote. It's so true. That is so true. And it's funny, you know, it makes me think, I mean, you were so fortunate to work for or, or have relationships with three uh, outstanding leaders and, and inspiring leaders or have them in your lives. Um, and I always say, you know, in the, in the PR graveyard, it doesn't say on our tombstone, we doubled the budget. I mean, it's very nice if you doubled the budget or, hey, they were great at pitching. Yeah, yeah. It's very nice to pitch business and win. But that and win silver anvils and all kinds of things. But our legacy is that leadership. And that legacy is having people like you talk about them and carry that into your own leadership. And I, I encourage all leaders inside PR and out it is never too early to think, what is my legacy? What is my impact on people and on future leaders? So I'm I'm glad you had that opportunity. That's a very profound, Ken. Um, and I, I absolutely really appreciate that because the truth is, is that I I will I can think back to the many wonderful pitches that I uh, participated in with um Ron Rogers. Uh, and I learned so much. 
But at the end of the day, it is about how I felt and about what he did for me in my career and what I, how I observed him. And so, yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate it. It's given me something to think about for sure. Yeah. So let, let's talk a little bit about the business, the PR business, the agency business. Under your leadership, Fenton leads the industry in diversity, equity, inclusion, DEI, with something like 55% of the agency's overall staff and 62% of your C-suite representing people of diverse backgrounds, people of color. So what's your answer to agency leaders who say, ah, oh, it's just too difficult to find quality, qualified candidates from diverse backgrounds? Well, the short answer is uh, I am a living proof that that is in <laughs> fact not true. Um, and uh, the really try harder and keep trying different approaches. I, I have no doubt that there is incredible intentionality uh, and and the, the desire for this to change. Um, but the truth is it, it's, it's really horrible um, that diversity hasn't changed much during my 30 years in this sector. I've worked for a number of agencies. I was the only a couple of times. And you know that was then, it shouldn't be now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I say when people ask, well, what's the secret sauce at Fenton? What are you doing differently? And I, I have said, well, there's a couple of things. One, I don't think that DEI is a one person's responsibility or that belongs in HR. Um, I think it's a shared responsibility. I think that it's something I know for us, we've created a, a DEI task force a number of years ago with staff across all levels, because we just, you know, certainly we know something, those of us with season and seniority have uh, been around a while, but to hear and to listen to people at all levels and all experiences um, and how we can be better in all ways uh, in, when it comes to diversity and inclusion has been incredibly beneficial to us. And so I, I do feel that we should not be afraid of those things uh, and hold ourselves accountable. Uh, we also, we have been open to people from non-traditional uh, backgrounds. And I know that this can be um, challenging for many agencies, but imagine if you come from nonprofit or if you, you come from philanthropy, you have lived experience that can be very applicable. It certainly can be, I, I understand not exactly the easiest transition, but it's worked for us. It's widened the pool. And I think that that is something, if, if we've had success, I say, try it out. Yeah, great, great counsel. And congratulations on those numbers. So this is the question we try to ask nearly all our leaders on this show. We ask that you be honest. What was your biggest leadership error in your career? And how did you recover? And what did you learn? Well, I'm going to be very open as I like to be. I and love that. Love that. <laughs> good, 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 good. I think um, my biggest error was initially not believing in myself enough mm. that I should take the role of CEO initially. Uh, when the opportunity presented itself, all I could do was think of every reason why someone else was more qualified than me. And I attribute this to, well, imposter syndrome, which, you know, we could talk a lot about <laughs> unconscious, <laughs> unconsciously buying into myths about who should be in these seats. Uh, you know, what that, you know, what does that person look like? Uh, you know, does that person have an advanced degree? Uh, you know, just what society tells us. Uh, and then honestly, good old fashioned fear. And I received some really incredible advice from a friend, a woman of color, in fact, CEO, and not in our industry, in a different industry, Connie Tang. Uh, and she said, you know, why don't you approach your owner and talk about doing an interim role for 100 days? Try it before you buy it, both sides. And she was because you will have a sense of what, if you have that opportunity, you should absolutely take it, even if you decide not to do it. And what that did for me is it really demystified the job. It built my confidence and it built my rapport and my partnership with our fantastic owner, James Marcus. And it allowed me to clap back 
at those inner demons, at those voices of doubt, because I was actually doing the job. So it was like, there's like, there's an idea of what the job is, and then you're actually doing the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So two years later, I'm so grateful. Uh, I took the job when, when I was asked after those hundred days. And I'm happy to say um, that I'm, I have no problem. I speak with this. Uh, I speak about this with lots of openness and vulnerability in hopes that I can inspire others who face their own doubts, their own demons. Um, and this is, I, I think, you know, what leadership is, is leaning in to what's uncomfortable and being courageous, even when you, you feel afraid and um, taking a risk and taking a risk and a chance on yourself. If others are willing to see that and do that for you, you should absolutely pay attention to it and and do it for yourself. You know, I always enjoy leaders' answers to that question when we ask them, but I'm not usually that inspired as I'm feeling right now because you just shared so much about combating imposter syndrome and lack of confidence and not believing the demons and believing in yourself. And I think many of us in all walks of life and all backgrounds uh, can face that from time to time. And when we can walk through those fears, I mean, it's not about not having fears, right? It's about having the fears and walking forward anyway. But look at how you have in those two years, look what you've been able to bring to your C-suite, to your teams, to your clients, um, you know, sometimes having the courage to walk through those demons allows us to share our gifts with many others. So I'm delighted to hear that story. Okay, last question. What is your message? Well, two-part question, I guess. What's your message to women of color who want to lead regardless of industry? Let's start with that and then we'll ask a second. Well, as as we just talked about, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, uh, imposter syndrome, you know, clapping back at those little voices that tell us that we can't do something, that it's not our time, um, that, we, you know, they that uh, someone smarter or more experienced than us should take on that job. So I say that to everybody. I say that to uh, whether you're a woman or a woman of color or a person of color. And I think you should ask, well, why not me? Um, that, that should be the question. Um, and maybe I will actually kick some butt. Maybe I will actually hit it out of the park. And I think that this is what we call, you know, in, in, in public relations or, you know, um, asset framing versus deficit framing. And I think in particular, when you're talking about, uh, women of color and people of color, you know, we, we come from sometimes some very challenging backgrounds. And I think that we tend to see that, um, as not something that's a strength, and it is a strength. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised by a single mother. That was that is not a deficit. In fact, she was a master class in resilience and agility. I use that every day now. She was a master class in problem solving. We talked about problem solving being at the center of leadership. So I think um, you know my message for particularly um, uh, you know anyone but women of color to to look at whatever you think whatever society has told you or you may have uh, bought into as being something that you don't have you absolutely have uh, in in you know in droves and that you that you can bring that to bear as a leader. And, and it's so funny you use the the uh, notion of asset framing from PR. I look at it, whether it's leadership or coaching or both, as, you know, do you live in a world of abundance? Do you see the abundance right. or the deficit? And every time we look to the abundance, we we can build more. We can grow more. There's no and we can apply that in in everything, in absolutely everything. what what do you have? What can you build on? Let's not worry about what's missing. We'll get there. Let, let's work on that. The other thing you said that I, I just want to reply to is the notion of, I, I, I mean, I get the words exactly right, but it was something about imagining doing it, imagining you're able to do the job or imagining you succeed. And when we, one word we use, phrase we use as a coach is, how will it feel? How will it feel? when you take that job? How will it feel when you succeed? How will you feel when you start to achieve those goals? And when we ask people, how will it feel? They literally start to feel it in their gut, in their being. And it's very compelling 
and it is very self-motivating. So I, I can't believe we're at the end. It flew by. I do want to thank you, Valerie De La Garza of Fenton, for being here, for sharing your wisdom, for sharing your energy, for giving such good counsel. And, you know, can we ask our viewers, can they reach out to you on LinkedIn if they're so moved? Oh, absolutely. I, I I would love to connect with anyone that um, wants to talk about any of the things that we've just discussed. Terrific. Thank you so much for your generosity. And as everyone knows, if you want to reach out to me to discuss coaching or leadership or training or can coaching work or, or all these things, you know where to find me. Let's see if I can spell my email address right. I don't know. It's not K-E-N at J-A-C-O-B-S-C-O-M-M dot com. K-E-N at J-A-C. I did it right. K-E-N at J-A-C-O-B-S-C-O-M-M dot com. Thank you again, Valerie De La Garza. And until next time, keep on taking the lead. <laughs>